You're on Team Human, Conscious Intervention in the Machine, coming to you alive from the green space at WNYC headquarters in New York City. This is where we stop using technology to optimize human beings for the market and start optimizing technology for the human future or even the present. It's not too late to make people a favored species, the subject of civilization's story rather than the objects. I'm Douglas Rushkoff and I'm on Team Human. Playing for Team Human today, Silicon Valley investor and now reformer, Roger McNamee. Roger will be talking about his new book about the mentorship of Mark Zuckerberg and what went wrong. Zucked, waking up to the Facebook catastrophe. It's time to intervene on behalf of people. I'm Douglas Rushkoff and you're on Team Human. So there we go. Hey, so thanks for coming out and, and I guess it wasn't that stormy for you at this point. It was nice and easy, see? It was all we had a two hour delay. You all had no school at all, but then it's just like normal. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about tonight. It's sort of, the, the, tonight kind of hits a certain nail on the head for, for this show. It's sort of talking about, we've been talking a lot about uh, algorithms and the loss of power and human autonomy in a digital age. And this is sort of really about that. Um, for me, Maybe this just shows what teaching at a college has done to me. I was reading Roger's book, which is really about Mark Zuckerberg and you know where he went wrong. And as I was reading it, I started to wonder, what would have happened if Mark Zuckerberg had stayed in school? <laughs> you know, if he hadn't dropped out and followed, you know, Bill Gates' footsteps. It was it was 2004 when he dropped out of school. And I get it, by the utilitarian logic of Silicon Valley startups, it makes sense, right? I got what I needed to, I got enough computer science and enough, a little bit of business to be able to get this company going up and out, right? Just go, you know, for going college, you know, sounds like a good idea, but he missed the history, the economics, the sociology, the psychology, and the basic humanities that could have, well, made his company not turn into the evil shite that it is. <laughs> so I figured, just for the fun of it, you know, as if, as if I were a real journalist, I, I dug up from the archives, which you can find on this great internet thing, I, I dug up the archived copies of Harvard's course catalogs from 2005 and 2006 to see what he might have taken, what courses he could have taken, and how that would have changed the course of history. So one of the first one I found was Greg Mankiw. Do you remember him? Greg Mankiw was on the, the President's uh, Economic Council, I think Bush one or something. He was a big, uh, a big Harvard economics professor and he was teaching principles of economics. And I was thinking, gosh, if Mark had taken that, he would have seen this sort of growth-based operating system of corporate capitalism. And maybe he wouldn't have wanted to put his social network at the mercy of those shareholders if he knew that they existed and what they were. Or have you heard of Helen Vendler, the literary superstar? She taught this course in 2005 called Literature and the Arts. And this is a good one. She quote, a study of poetry as the history and science of feeling. Wow, and that was kind of deep. What would he have been able to predict his platform's bias for emotional insensitivity, or could maybe he have curtailed his use of language as a cognitive weapon if he knew a little bit about poetry as history and poetry as emotion, or he could have gone and taken Steven Pinker, of all people. Steven Pinker was teaching the human mind. I mean, not that I agree with what he said, but he probably, you know, had some decent readings, right? He, it, the course, he lists, he says, he teaches psychoanalysis, behavioralism, cognitive neuroscience. So imagine if Mark Zuckerberg had studied consciousness in an academic or even an ethical context before he set upon entrancing the entire collective psyche. Maybe. Right? Or, or Neil Ferguson's history course. This guy's kind of weird too, but he, talked to, he, he ta taught a course called Democratic Change and Social Stratification, which is basically a primer in nationalism from uh, a, a quasi-nationalist himself, but at least he would have been exposed to it. Or on the other side, he could have taken Henry Louis Gates' class. He, he taught this class called the Harlem Renaissance. 
I was thinking, gosh, if he had taken the Harlem Renaissance, then he might have understood the difference between a neighborhood of real people interacting in real space and coming up with a culture and an online affinity group. That's <laughs> something really different, <laughs> turns out. Or Pulitzer Prize winning historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Do you guys know her? Her, her work is supposed to show, show the interconnections between public events and private experience. Isn't that heavy? Yeah. Public events and private experience, like inner worlds, right? Private experience, so maybe, just maybe learning about that delicate interplay between people's in interior and public worlds would have led him, led him to think twice about offering up his users' brain stems to the highest political bidder. <laughs> yes, and he's apologized for what he'd done to democracy, but what if he had chosen to study the elements of working democracy before he re-engineered it on all our behalf? When he dropped out of school, he was barely 20 years old. His brain wasn't even fully developed. Right? The myelin sheaths hadn't formed around his frontal cortex yet. He didn't yet have impulse control. And so he left these professors, who I promise you were dedicated to developing his mind. And he turned to venture capitalists like Sean Parker of Napster, it's that sort of music stealing platform, and, and <laughs> Peter Palantir Thiel. Um, so, yeah. Palantir, P Peter Palantir Theo, uh, uh, so a music stealing platform and a government data mining spy agency were his mentors. No wonder Facebook became about what? Surveillance capitalism. And Thiel, he still wants more easily manipulated, he did good with Mark, right? Wants more easily manipulated kids that he can, that he can pivot their companies over toward evil. So he's got the Thiel Fellowship, $100,000. Why sit in, this is what they say right on the website, why sit in a classroom when you can build something? That's what I'm saying. Why, sit, why build something when you could sit in a classroom? <laughs> or at least sit in a classroom before you build something. No, but, but, but we don't think that way anymore. Education's become utilitarian, right? It's, it, it's not supposed to be. And I've talked about this before, but education, public education was invented not as an extension of work, but as compensation for work. It was so the coal miner could come home from work and be, have the dignity to read a novel and appreciate it, or read the newspaper and understand enough about politics to vote effectively. You know, it, 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 it's, it's not utilitarian, but now, our principals go and meet with the CEOs of companies to find out what do you need from the worker of tomorrow? Should we teach them Excel? Do we teach them blockchain? What, what, are we, what, are, what do you want? As if we're just delivering workers to companies, you know, helping them externalize the cost of job training to the public sector. And that's, I get it, you know? Zook got the message, right? He got the message. Education is a form of social control, screw it. And so he understood himself and now the rest of us in terms of our utility value. And, and no, that's what, if anything, that's what Team Human is fighting against. Education was for dignity. Ed education is a celebration of human dignity. Life should be, technology should be. How sad it is that so many of us now, we think about a Harvard education, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? The professional credential of a Harvard education. Not the idea that this is some pinnacle of humanism. Yet if he had finished school, if he had finished school, Facebook might have come out two years later. But what a difference those two years might have made. You're on Team Human, coming to you alive from WNYC's Green Space, where nonprofit and creature comfort are no longer mutually exclusive. Playing for Team Human on this special evening, musician, investor, technology reformer, and the author of Zooked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, my new friend, Roger McNamee. Welcome. Thanks for... Oh, we got these ones. See, they change automatically. Thank you for playing on Team Human. It, it, you know, it, it's nice to be on a team. <laughs> I've spent the last two years trying to like wave my arms and go, this thing that I've been involved in for 38 years that I was so proud of being part of and that I was so excited about has suddenly, you know, become an existential crisis. And it took a while for me to understand what I was looking at. And it's taken a couple of years before, 
you know, there were enough of us out there talking about it to make a difference. But I feel really optimistic now. And the thing I want to make sure we do tonight is everybody needs to leave here knowing that not only is there a path forward, but we all have a role in it. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, I want to start with that because when I tell you the story of how I got here, parts of it are really bleak. And parts of it make me feel like a complete moron. And uh, it, uh, but you know, when you humiliate yourself, uh, you can learn a lot, right? It's it's a growth experience, and it was for me. Yeah, well, the only good trip's a bad trip. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, actually, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's some that are just bad. But no, I agree that 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 certainly being able to paint a a, a picture or. or uh, use a narrative that has something other than well, let's just bet on disaster. You know, let's let's figure out you know, what we can do is sort of a positive way to. Well, I, you know, the th the thing you, you need to understand that I arrived in Silicon Valley in 1982. They were still in the tail end of the Apollo era, right? If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, you know, the guys with the white and they were all guys, short sleeve white shirts, the ties, the pocket protector. Right, and they're, you know, they were making the space shuttle. That was the big thing in defense electronics. And then the personal computer industry happens. And the thing about it was, if you were in Silicon Valley at that time, you got used to this notion that everything you made would make the world a better place. Steve Jobs used to talk about this concept of bicycles for the mind, right? This idea that human beings are in, if you rank all the species in locomotion, human beings are only about two-thirds of the way up the stack. And at the top, you have, have you know, the, the giant birds with the ability to fly around the world. But if you give a human a bicycle, they become the most efficient at locomotion on the face of the earth. And Steve thought that's what he could do with personal computers. And that's the world I spent, you know, essentially the first 28 or nine years of my career in. And then it changed, and I didn't notice it. And I'm a professional analyst. I should have noticed it, but I didn't. And, you know, I really liked Zuck, and I really liked uh, Sheryl Sandberg, and I liked uh, the people I knew there. But I knew that Silicon Valley had changed because I had had to pass on Zynga, I'd had to pass on Spotify, and I'd had to pass on Uber because philosophically their business models were about a form of predation, right, about taking advantage of, of weakness. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, that's not what I do. And so I, I had to, you know, I was planning on being retired. And so when I first started to notice the problems at Facebook, I was blissfully retired with my wife on vacation and started to see bad things. And it came as a complete shock. And so the book, I write the book from the perspective of Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window, right? Which is, I'm looking out the back window and I see what looks like a crime. Except there's no way there's a crime taking place across the way. And... That's how I felt about it. But I, like Jimmy Stewart, I pull on the thread. And I discover that I really had a mistaken impression of what was going on at Facebook. And it took better part of the last two years to understand it. And I'm still learning, OK? But it's uh, your book. So his book, Team Human, uh, really influenced me. I wish it, there have been three books that have come out this calendar year that I wish had come out before I wrote mine. Uh, his would be one, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, and a book called uh, Future Politics uh, by a guy named Jamie Suskind. And, you know, we're getting ahead of this curve. People are really beginning to understand what's going on here, and that's making it a lot easier to both spread the word and organize the rebellion. We're gonna, we're gonna bust the Death Star. You watch. I mean, it's funny. I'm, I'll, I'm a Trekkie, I'll go okay? So a Death Star for me is like it's like a different thing. But there's no analog to the Death Star in, in, in Star Trek, so I have to go to the Star. The Wars. thing I'm interested in is, and and I mean, all of us, all of us who care, kind of fell off the certain. Uh, techno utopian bus at different stages. You know, for me it was 1994, right? <laughs> when when Wired when Wired supplanted. Stop bragging. No, I'm not. But no, no, it's not about that. It was what for me because it was personal. But it was always personal. You know, for me it was when Wired supplanted Mondo 2000. I'm like, oh, look what they've done to my song. You know, and then when the dot com boom busted, I thought 
Yay, now it's going to become the people's internet again, and the emergence of social media seemed to be, oh, these are going to be true internet companies yeah. rather than just, you know, pets.com. Yeah. Well, and you have to, when I first met Mark, so it's 2006, the company is two years old, and he's only 22. Mm. And the context for the meeting was that I got an email from the chief privacy officer at Facebook, a guy named Chris Kelly saying, my boss has got a crisis he's dealing with, and he needs to talk to somebody who's been around a long time, who knows the industry, who can keep a secret, and is not conflicted. And apparently that was a really small set of people because this guy didn't know me, and he reached out anyway. And he said, can you take a meeting with my boss? And here's the thing. I've, I've been doing tech forever, and I'd been part of Kleiner Perkins for a dozen years, so I'd watched Friendster up close, and I'd watched um, really every every social networking app, and MySpace in particular. And the thing that I'd concluded from f starting with uh, AOL and then Friendster and, and, and MySpace was that anonymity was actually a mistake when it came to network products. And the key thing about Facebook in 2006 is they only had college students and high school students. You had to have an email from your school, which was a form of authenticated identity that really mm. was a mitigant to the notion of trolling. And I thought that was going to change everything. Plus, he gave you the ability to control who could see your stuff. It was a form of privacy control that really meant something. So I, I said, sure, I'd love to meet your boss. I said, you know, next Friday I should be okay. And following week, I'm good Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They said, how about 1 o'clock? And I go, well, okay. So I move something, and he comes by my office that day at 1 o'clock. Now, you have to imagine, Elevation Partners, which was a firm that I had started with, Bono, who's a singer, uh, John Riccatello, who'd been the president of Electronic Arts, the world's largest video game company, and Fred Anderson, who was the CFO of Apple, had a conference room set up like a living room with this giant video game console. I mean, huge flat panel display, massive speakers. So it was soundproof to within an inch of its life. Listen to this room if I say nothing for 10 seconds. Hell, that's five seconds. But you know what I mean? Really dead. So he comes in here. He's sitting as far from me as I am from you. We're in these comfy chairs. And I say, Mark, you don't know me. The minute you start talking, anything I say after that, you'll just assume has been influenced by whatever you told me. So do you mind if I give you two minutes of context for why I'm taking this meeting? He goes, fire away. I go, if it hasn't already happened, either Microsoft or Yahoo, is going to offer $1 billion for Facebook. And everybody you know is going to tell you to take it. Now, why? They'd had a $9 million a year from doing basically display ads for pizza delivery. It was not yet a real business. So a billion dollars was ridiculous. And I said, oh, I think you've broken the code. I think this privacy thing you've got and this uh, uh, real identity are going to allow you to be as big as Google is today. And if you believe your vision, I think you should follow it because nobody in Silicon Valley has a great idea at the perfect time twice. What fault, you know, I'm laying this big trip on him, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I'm really laying it. I've taken a huge risk, right? I don't know this guy. He's 22, I'm 50. And I've just said, your company's going to be got for a billion dollars, right? It's just, I have a really high probability of looking like a complete fool. I'm expecting an answer. And I'm in this totally deadened room. I get complete silence. I get this, then I get this, then I get this. The one minute mark goes by and I'm thinking, wow, he's really thinking about this. Must be deciding whether he trusts me. At the two minute mark, I'm getting really uncomfortable. Have you ever sat with somebody you're expecting an answer from for two minutes and they don't say a word? It is really unnerving. At three minutes, I'm digging my fingers into the upholstery. At four minutes, I am literally ready to scream. I can't, I've never been in a room with anybody. I mean, seriously, if the nuns didn't make us do this when I was a little kid. I mean, it was horrible. Anyway, somewhere between four and five minutes, he vir visibly relaxes. and He goes, you won't believe this, but that thing you just said, that's why I'm here. That exact thing just happened. We got offered a billion dollars. Everybody told me to take the money. How did you know? And I go, I didn't.
but I've been here a long time, and I know all the players, and this is how they think. And they figured you're 22, you just had a $9 million a year, $1 billion dollars is a lot of money. They can get your company, but they're going to kill it. So what do you want to do? You want to sell or you want to keep it? He goes, oh, I don't want to disappoint everybody, but I'd really like to follow my vision. I go, well, let's figure out how to do that. It turns out it took only five minutes. The entire meeting lasted half an hour. He leaves. He calls me up the next day and invites me over to his office. That begins a three-year period where I am one of many mentors he had. And you are correct. He had Peter Thiel, who was the first money into the company. He, he no longer had Sean Parker. Sean, Sean, basically, if you've watched the movie, you understand yeah. <laughs> why Sean wasn't involved anymore. But he's, he had Mark Andreessen after Sean. Mm-hmm. And he had Don Graham, who was the son of Kate Graham from the Washington Post. And Don had been involved for over a year. And those three were much closer than I was. But they'd all advocated the sale of the company. So I had a special position because I hadn't. And since he wasn't selling the company, he had to be, he had to have at least some people to talk to who didn't think selling the company was the right idea. And I demonstrably been on that side because I told him not to sell it before he even told me that's what the issue was. And so it was a great, my relationship with him literally couldn't have been better. But if you had told him, if you had not told him not to sell, and Marissa Meyer got a hold of the company and did to Facebook what she did to Tumblr. Well, it, wouldn't have, um, it would have been would, pre-Marissa, but. Oh, well, anyway, whoever it was there would have killed it. But um, yeah. would we be in a better, better shape now? <laughs> well, I, I, we, we might have a different political situation, but no, we would not be in better mm. shape. Because the real problem, weirdly enough, is Google. You know, Google's the one who figured this out in 2003. And so, so with the help of the CIA and yeah, the NSA, the, the, and the, the world else, yeah. the world would be different. Okay, right. I think demonstrably different because no one else would have had the same impact on democracy that Facebook has had, and de- demonstrably nobody could have done Myanmar the way Facebook did it mm. or Sri Lanka, and those are horrible situations. And so I I look at this and I go, if you ask me why did I do this. You know, my role was one of many, many parents in a successful situation, a company I was incredibly proud of. The other thing I did was um, about a year and a half after I started helping him out, he finally got rid of the original chief operating officer, or the second one, and he was looking for a new one. And I introduced him to a person I knew really well, Cheryl Sandberg, and suggested she would be the right person, brokered her going there. And I tell the story of that in the book because... The way I got to know Cheryl was, I mean, it was like one of those off-the-wall coincidences that make you realize that life is really about dumb luck. And, uh, you know, I started my career on the first day of the bull market of 1982 as a tech analyst. And in an industry where timing is everything, you literally couldn't do better than that starting condition. And then I had a whole series of things like Cheryl Sandberg being at the Treasury Department and working with this guy from Ireland named Bono on forgiving the world's third world debt, introducing Bono to me, which leads to our creating elevation. So I returned the favor by introducing her to Mark Zuckerberg. So I feel really good about my relationship there. And the problem with this is I'm out of there by 2009. And by 2009, they are totally not figured out yet what they're doing, right? They understand that they need to have this manipulative, persuasive technology to get your attention to sell ads, but they haven't figured out how to do it yet, right? They just, they know they need to, but they haven't figured it out. And when in 2016, the failure of analysis, there were two or three points along the way when I could have understood what the problem was. And I just missed it because the incentives that I had were blinding me to data that was out there. And uh, you know, I freely confess this because it's a really important thing for all of us to recognize that we're going to make mistakes. And it's really hard to reverse yourself on a firmly held belief if you're not prepared to admit that where you started was wrong. Right. But then the question is, how far back do we go to that starting place? So sometimes when I read... I I think you had it right. I mean, I think that I've had this debate, and I got my head bitten off by Dustin Moskowitz, who's one of the other founders of Facebook, because I said, you know, I, I made an off the cuff comment about, you know, they just hadn't read enough philosophy or history. Mm. And Dustin goes, I read a thousand books by the time we started Facebook. And I didn't say anything because at that point I realized, you know, there's no point in having the argument. But the 
internalizing the lessons of history and the lessons of philosophy or comparative religion um, might well have had an impact in their worldview. But here's the problem. Mm. If he doesn't start the company in 2004, it doesn't become Facebook. It was the perfect idea at the perfect moment in time. The thing was that the original idea he had with authenticated mm. identity and real privacy would have been a massive success. But it would have been orders of magnitude smaller than it is now. And what I didn't understand about Mark, because I never experienced it, was that with all the cool stuff, with that tremendous idealism and vision that he had, he also had a need to win in a way where other people lose. Hmm. He's like Larry Ellison that way. Right, zero and sum by the way, I, I don't have any experience with this. That's been relayed to me by other people who, shall we say, have been on the pointy end of it. And, um, and he's very competitive. And there's nothing wrong with being super competitive as long as you know when to stop. And I think his idealism, his notion that connecting the whole world on one network was so obviously a good idea that it justified whatever means were necessary to get there. That form of idealism is obviously toxic. And I think the founders of Google have a very similar problem with you know, collecting all the world's information and making it available. And it's, they're going to collect it, make it available, but on their terms. Right. Well, they're not just collecting the world's information. They're replacing, they're becoming the world's information, and, which is and, one and, of the and, difference. And, and, and deciding the curriculum, right? I mean, the other thing they're doing is right. they're, they're determining what you get to see of the world's information. Right. But, I'm, but again, though, I, I'm, I'm looking at what, what level do we attack the problem? Sometimes when you describe it, it sounds like, look, if we just tweaked this... No, like no. this instead of that. No, it's a business model problem. So, but I, a business model problem, or right? So, there's a business model problem that okay, these are companies that are that are based on either surveillance capitalism or data extraction rather than a service. Or is that what's necessarily going to happen when you're running a company on the economic operating system of corporate capitalism, where you're demanding 100x growth in well, a company? It's not so a business model. That's I just began, business. When I began my career. Corporate America still had a philosophy that it, it owed an obligation to half a dozen different stakeholders. So yes, shareholders, but also employees, the communities where they lived, land labor customers, capital, yeah, right, suppliers, business, right. Yeah. There were all these different stakeholders that they that they took care of. And after the oil shock in seventy three and seventy four, the U.S. economy that had essentially beaten the Depression, won the Second World War, and had the peace afterwards, was blown up because it was entirely based on 25 cent a gallon gasoline. And so when that went away, we had that long period of stagnation and inflation at the same time. And coming out of that, the notion of liberating the economy by getting rid of regulation, by getting rid of, of overhead, seemed like a logical thing. And for at least 10 years after it, it worked really well, mm. more or less for everyone. And for 10 years after that, it worked with diminishing returns. It's the last 18 years where I think you can say demonstrably, we've just done a good thing for way, 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 way too long. So that what you have today is not capitalism. What you have today is more like, you know, kleptocracy. Because, you know, I if, if you haven't read it, um, uh, Thomas Piketty's book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, makes a really interesting point, which is that if, if in a deregulated world where capital is king, the rate of growth in capital will always see, exceed the rate, the rate of return on capital will always exceed the rate of growth of the underlying market. Capital will expect a, a surplus return mm -hmm. for what it does. And that the capital will always have slightly more resources than everyone else. So it will be able to buy the best lawyers, the best lobbyists, the best accountants. And over 30 or 40 years of just very small changes of people doing their job, the lawyers doing their job, the lobbyists doing their job, the accountants doing their job, essentially you're going to tip the, the playing field more and more to their advantage. And you won't have to have any nefarious actions going on. The problem is that when you get to an extreme place such as where we are now, there's no chance for competition to work, right? Because what you've done is essentially deregulated yourself into a world where monopolies or oligopolies dominate the entire right. economy. And they're not just hiring the, the best people, they're hiring the best algorithms. Well, and to be clear, it's not even clear that they're hiring the best people. What they're yeah. doing is they're hiring the people necessary and willing to do the work 
in that situation, right? They have, they have such massive advantages now that the people are less important, right? And so when I think about, about what's going on the internet, can I give you like two minutes yeah. of, of, of my worldview? Because I think Zuboff's really got this, this part of it exactly right, which is that the basic notion is it began as an advertising business where you gathered data on people uh, because your product wasn't very good. An ad that's in a news feed zips by very quickly. And so what you need to do is get people to come back a lot. So how did you do that? You did that by playing to the same kind of psychological tricks that a slot machine plays to, right? Variable rewards. You give people notifications. You give them likes. You give them all sorts of things like that that are not, they don't happen randomly. Right? Right. You've no, got an and, AI and you, doing it exactly right. at the moment. And you go to the offices of, of Snapchat or any of these companies and you see the Las Vegas slot machine algorithm textbooks okay. you know, and, and being so, embedded in their, in their platforms. So that's how they get you to come back, right? They build habits. And for many people, it turns into an addiction. And I always ask every audience I'm in, when do you check your phone first thing in the morning? Is it before you pee or while you're peeing? Right? Because I don't know anybody who waits any longer than that. <laughs> so once they got you coming in a lot, then they got to get you to do a lot of stuff. Because if you remember the early days of Facebook, before Zynga, people were on there for a minute or two a day. And you just couldn't monetize that. And the thing that Zynga and the game guys did, and the reason that thing that led to Cambridge Analytica, was that they discovered that social games, the players of those games were on for an hour or two a day. So they saw a gazillion more ads. And so from Facebook's point of view, they had to get you to spend more time. And there they discovered that you could show people wedding photos or puppies or babies, but something that makes me happy might make you jealous, and you're not going to share it. Whereas something that makes me outraged or afraid, if I share that with you, you're going to share it with other people because it turns out when you're outraged or you're afraid, having a, as you've written so eloquently in your book, mm -hmm. Right, you, you want to share that because it makes you feel better to be not alone. Right, we're just being played by memes. Really okay, and so right. so you wind up in this exactly in this mimetic world where they are playing with your emotions, right? And the whole point is they want to manipulate your attention. The part they didn't think about, and I really think this was an innocent mistake, was they didn't think about the fact that the tools could be manipulated by a third party to actually manipulate what people believe. And that, you know, in a sense, with filter bubbles, what they were trying to do was to uh, give you what you wanted so you'd spend more time there. What they didn't think about was what happens when you give people a Truman Show, right? I mean, I grew up in the 50s and 60s when the filter bubbles of the day were CBS, ABC, and NBC. And, you know, everybody my age saw the Kennedy funeral, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and the moon landing. And, you know... The thing we were worried about was conformity. And those filter bubbles were very powerful, but there was only one set of facts, and right. we all had them. What these guys did was they went, oh, I can do that for each individual person. I can have 2.3 billion monthly users, and everybody has their own Truman Show. In that world... And their own Google search and their own everything. Right. And so in that world, everybody can have their own facts. And this is the point you make so eloquently in Team Human, that that you get this situation where there is no need to compromise because the, you're under this illusion that everyone believes the same things you do because your entire news feed is full of people who agree with you. And if you join groups, right, let's say you're anti-vax curious and you want to understand what this is about, you join an anti-vax group, the constant reinforcement every single day for a period of time causes your points of view to become more rigid and more extreme. And so what happens is, from Facebook's point of view, all of those things are good because they increase your time on site. From society's right. point of view, it's a disaster. No, and they were good for the original advertising model. You create an affinity group of, of Mini Cooper users, and they love the car more and more every time they, they come back. And it, then, it didn't seem nefarious. So that's phase one. Yeah. Then you get to phase two, and this is where Google... I mean, all these things were so brilliant, but deeply evil, too which is a nasty combination that you're used to getting from a Bond guy with a cat and a big ring. Um, so what Google's great insight was that in trying to gather information from users to improve search, 
it picked up tons and tons of other data that had nothing to do with improving search, but which they discovered by putting into machine learning systems had signal that could be used for behavioral prediction. Mm. And so beginning in 2003, Google started to patent and then perfect systems for behavioral prediction. And they were using what they euphemistically called digital exhaust, right? But it's really digital solid gold and diamonds, okay? Um, and you know, we sit there and go, people come up to me, Roger, I got nothing to worry about. My data is already out there. I can't get it back. I'm a good person. And I go, yeah, that's true if you're worried about hacking. But it's, that's not the problem we're right. facing. In phase two, what this is about is it's about the fact that we've gone from being the product, which is what we were in phase one, to being now the fuel. So they gather the data. Think about this. When you buy a car, there are like 200 things you do before you buy a car. 20 of which are related to buying the car and the rest are other stuff. These guys collect that stream from everybody who winds up buying a car. Thousands and thousands of them. They look at it, they find the common patterns. And the behavioral prediction is they start to look for the next people who start down the similar paths. And the price goes up the further you are down the path. So if you're at number 100, maybe you've got a 20% chance of buying a car. At 150, you're probably a 50, 60% mm. chance. At 175, you're like a 90% chance, right? And after that, it's not advertising, it's lead generation. You're getting paid really serious mm. money. And they figured that out. Google figured it out first. And it took Facebook a lot longer to get that to work, right? Facebook first started to get to work in 2013 and not very effectively, but much more recently they've done it better. And here's where it gets really creepy is that they- It wasn't creepy already. <laughs> well, but it gets, it, it hang on, it gets, it gets creepy. way creepier. So, so the, in phase two, you then sit there and go, what are the things I can do to raise the probability that my- my behavioral forecast is correct. Well, I got my filter bubble, right? I can actually tune what people think. What else could I do? Well, I've got AI. So, for example, you know, I can affect job search outcomes by, shall we say, allowing certain kinds of, of uh, biases into the, into the AI for re resume review. Like right? if you're Google and you're sitting there and saying, Gosh, I like the fact that all my employees are males between 25 and 35, either uh, Caucasian or Asian. And I really would like to stay that way. So I'm going to tune my AI so the AI will seem to be impartial, but tells me, oh, these are the obviously most qualified people. And then what's the third one? The third one is recommendation engines. You sit there and go, wow, I like this, this uh, playlist, or I like this Amazon recommendation and it's based on what I've already liked and I'm going well sort of but you can see where it's going right, right? right. Amazon knows so much about you it can tune the, the prices right. of the and thing that, it says to what you're actually you know what they think your income is yeah and the crime and the crime against humanity in this is that if you were you know 80 percent likely to buy this car or go on a diet or get divorced or do whatever and they're trying to get that probability up then what are they doing to the 20% of people who are going to do something else? Exactly. What are they doing to, to... So that takes us to phase three, right? Which is, if you guys ever seen CAPTCHA, which is, you know, when you're like logging on to the Financial Times, you have to prove you're a human by looking at traffic signs or cars in those photographs. You understand that's not to figure out if you're a human. That's actually training Google's AI for automobiles. Right, they're looking for. That's what I always say. Find the find the headlights, right. the, or the find the stoplights in this. Right, in the stoplights. Yeah. That that has nothing to do. With, they already know you're a human. You know how they know you're a human? They can tell from your mouse movements. Now think about this for a minute. Google has a long time series of your mouse movements. If you're on uh, Gmail and Google Maps, you know, particularly Gmail, you, they're going to get to watch your mouse movement a lot and search too, and. If you develop a neurological problem, you know, you maybe slow down a little bit, your hand gets a little bit shakier, they're going to know this way before you do. Now, ask yourself, who is their customer? <laughs> I would say insurance companies, yeah. right? It's worth way more to them to sell it to your insurance company to either raise your rates or cut your coverage than just to show it to you. And Amazon proved this point by going into a joint venture in health insurance 
And, you know, my point here is that there are no rules today. None, right? And, but here's the really good news, right? Is that there's 100,000 people who work at Google. There's 30,000, 32,000 work at Facebook. I forget how many 100,000 work at Microsoft. It's low hundreds of thousands. Uh, and, uh, and then Amazon, again, depending on who you count, yeah. it's hundreds of thousands also. But my point is that all three of them together are less than a million. And there are 340 million people in the U.S. And obviously 7 billion globally. So we outnumber them. So we have a lot of political power right now. And there's a rapidly building awareness of this. And what's really interesting, as I've worked super hard since I put my book out to position this as right versus wrong as opposed to right versus left. Um, I think I just did my seventh or eighth appearance on Fox since the mm -hmm. books came out. And I'm super welcome there because everybody understands this is about uh, you know, liberty in the classic founding father sense. This is about self-determination in the, in the you know, uh, psycholo psychological sense. And, n you know, there's, n there's only one right answer on these things, right? And these guys are on the wrong side of it. And so what I'm feeling here and what I really hope that we're, we're all going to do both tonight and going forward is recognize that we have way more power than we realize in this particular scenario and that things are coming our way really rapidly. I mean... Seriously, I've been at this as a public person for, you know, two years. And <laughs> two years ago, there was nobody to talk to, right? And now, you know, I'm speaking every night, and there's a full house everywhere I go, and I'm not the only one. You're out there talking yeah. about it. Shoshana Zuboff's out there talking about it. There's dozens of people. Tristan's out there. But then, the, but then the question is, wh at what? Uh, what's our point of attack? In other words, it sounds so. You're you're a, a co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology. Yeah. Now I've made fun of them a little bit just because. By the of way, the name. you should. No, no, hang. You should make fun of us because we started this <laughs> thing before we really understood what the problem was. Right. I mean, this right. this the problem here is. I mean, I've learned so much since I finished the book. Right. I mean, I consciously wrote the book as chapter one of a much larger story. Right. It's basically designed to give you the tools for dealing with the problem, consciously knowing that we didn't even know the full dimension of the problem. But let me answer your question. Yeah. So I want to start by asking four questions. And there, it's the same question, but with four, um, four elements to it. All of this is based on a notion. So preamble. All of this is based on a notion that we can do a transaction for a service or a product. We give up some data. And the person we do the transaction with is allowed to declare eminent domain and own our data and use it any way they like forever and ever. That's the current status quo. And we've never actually as a country or a world had a conversation about whether that's a legitimate idea or not. Well, Europe has. No, actually, yeah. weirdly enough, weirdly enough, Europe's, Europe's having the conversation yeah. now, but I would like to argue that they're having a conversation about your data, not about the... So behavioral prediction is not based on the data you put into the system. It's based on the metadata. It's based on right. all those other mouse clicks. It's based on the shaking of your hand. Um, and, and global data protection regulation, which is the European thing, is very explicitly... Oh, they're looking at content rather well, they, than... Yeah, they're, they're looking yeah. at what you put into the system, right. which is a, a wonderful thing, but unfortunately, not going right. to solve the problem. And so when I look at this, I look at this as I want to ask really simple questions. Why is it legitimate to have any commerce at all in personal financial transaction data? So credit cards, mortgages, all that kind of stuff, other than the actual transaction that you're giving the data for. Why is it? I think that's a good question. And <laughs> remember, we have a general election coming up in 2020. Right. That would be an excellent time to have this question on the ballot. Another one, um, why is it legitimate to do the same thing for geolocation data? So keep in mm -hmm. mind, it's not Google and Facebook who are selling geolocation or are selling uh, personal financial transactions. They're buying, right? They're buying the financial transactions from banks and credit card processors. They're buying geolocation from the cellular carriers. Why is it legitimate for people who have, you know, uh, smart watches or... Uh, you know, health watches or health apps. In short, everybody but Apple in the health business to trade that data. 
I mean, we have a thing called HIPAA that prevents you from doing it from a right. hospital. Well, why, why are you allowed why to do it? Why is it okay for Google to track my location data when the maps is off? Uh, exactly. Okay. And so why, in fact, why are you allowed to be tracked on the web at all? Okay. And then the last one is why do we allow people to even collect data on minors? I mean, right. what's up with that? Right. And here you are. And the good thing is you you got rich off this, but you're not building a bunker in New Zealand to escape from the people. No, I'm spending the money the trying force. to solve the problem. Right. Now you're, you're turned around and you're facing the, the world that, that you helped destroy, but not really. We all did. <laughs> but you know, in some sense. No, it's and, all my fault, honest to God. Not all, I, but partly. Um, but you're like, let's, let's, let's fix this. So then... And then, so then I read, you know, Center for Humane Technology stuff, and Tristan, I mean, is great, and, and, and it's all great, but I keep thinking it, it's still looking at technology from how is the technology treating us people, as if we're still the, the passive party. In well, it. Uh, no, I, I think that is a completely legitimate criticism, and I don't want to actually spend any time on it, because I think the questions I just asked right. are a much better place to start. Right, but then what, and how do we answer? So we say it's wrong. Where do they get off doing what, that? They get off I, doing it because they were because Google was a bunch of, of CIA no, no. spooks who thought that people no, were no, dangerous it started before and that. exploited that company. It started before that. It started when this was benign, that when your credit card information uh, transaction data and your uh, you mean you like know, the era of stuff. direct mail and Vigory and all those well, guys I was, doing uh, no I'm I, I'm saying that in the early days before you had machine learning and AI to make find these other patterns. The stuff was largely used the way advertising research was done. So, you know, they would gather data from you in order to offer you a better service or product. Right. Now they're treating you as a fuel source, right? And you don't get any benefit, right? In that example I gave you about buying a car, right? The people whose data is gathered get no benefit from that experience at all. And that's what's wrong with the current model. And it all starts with the fact that you don't have to be on Facebook. You do not have to be on Google. You do not have to be on LinkedIn. You do not have to be on Amazon to be harmed by this data economy because somebody can go to your credit card companies and your banks and get all your personal financial data. They can go to your um, cellular carrier and get something that gives them a proxy for your location. They can uh, go to various people on the web and get tracking data there. I mean, there, you can compile an incredibly high-resolution picture of anybody today because there are no rules. And so what I would like to do is I would like to stop that. And the best way to stop it is not to sit there and try to do what GDPR does, the Global Data Protection Regulation, which is to say, these things have happened, so we're going to give you back control of your data after the damage has been done. Right. I'm going to say, no, no, no. I want to I have a debate the goal of which is to stop entirely certain classes of data commerce. I want to just stop commerce in financial data, health data, location data, um, anything related to children, okay? And I would like to find ways to stop tracking on the web also, okay? Now, interestingly enough, you've got a guy on the web who's baking, building a business model around that last concept, which is Apple, right? They're not perfect by any stretch, but they are so much better now that having an Android today is really almost a, a willful decision to leave yourself. Well, you pay it, for your privacy. And well, if in you a, want it for well, free, you you give them your data. Yeah, but it, the the problem is that the cost of that today isn't just to you; it's to everyone you know and millions of people you do not know. See, the problem is that we're all in this room here together tonight. They know we're all in this room together tonight. So sadly, all you guys are being tarred with the brush that's being put on They me. know that we're and part of the conspiracy. They know we're part of the conspiracy, and that's now part of your profile. And I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, you're not going to um, get any real estate in China. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> you're for sure not going to get any real estate on, on is it Kauai, where Mark has his? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it, it's, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a societal scale problem that can only be so solved by us working together, which is why Team Human is so important. This is really about all of us getting together. Mark will sit there and tell you, you know, we can just solve this with a little bit more code and a little bit more AI. And I'm going, the one thing I'm certain of is that that's not the answer. because Right, there's not a patch. Right. No, well, especially not yeah. for things like preference bubbles, right? Filter bubbles are when they impose a worldview on you. A preference bubble is when you adopt it as your own. So when you become an anti-vaxxer or you become a climate change denier or you become a flat earther, right? 
that point, it's preference bubble. And once you're at that point, then only human intervention can cure so, that. So you, and, and for you, human intervention means going back to, to sort of undoing Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, bringing kind of government and regulation back into well, this and I, doing actually, it that way? Well, I actually think it starts with coming in one room and just agreeing we're all on the same team, okay? I think that's an excellent start. I, I do believe we need regulation, but I think the thing I'm talking about is actually, look, I need to do another confession. And in uh, the early aughts and the late 90s, early aughts, I was such an aggressive early adopter of technology that at one time I had seven mobile devices on my belt. I looked like Batman, <laughs> but without the cape and without the cool. And now with one iPhone, you've got 200 mobile devices in your pocket. Exactly. And so, so I had yeah. all these devices, right? And my life was, has been for at least 20 years completely mediated by technology. And what I discovered when I began this process here was that there were a lot of people that I had completely lost human touch with, people I'd only been in touch with over Facebook or over texting or over email. And so I consciously, 18 months ago, set out to re-engage face-to-face with a lot of people I'd lost touch with, which has been an immensely satisfying thing because I had allowed myself, as you describe in your book, to become completely isolated. Mm. And one of the things that's interesting about writing a book like mine and doing a campaign like mine is that you lose one whole ecosystem of your life, right? Because pretty much everybody I did business with, well, the, m- many of them are not happy with me. Let's just This is the life of the writer. You move and through to a social circle and then betray them all and move to the next, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's speak what Truman for, Capote used Douglas, to talk about speak, that. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I, 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 I merely You're fouled, one book in. I fouled... No, I'm... No I, stopping. I, I, I fouled my nest, and I am setting about building a new one okay. with all of you. And... And I mean that sincerely. So part of my optimism comes from the fact that I think we all knew in our heart of hearts that something wasn't right here. And, you know, what I love is that for the first year we were doing this, Tristan and I were trying to build awareness. We were just trying to to get people to be aware that things were not right in the kingdom. And for the last, I don't know, six or seven months, we haven't had to do a thing because journalists uncover something profound every single day. And the stuff they find is way cooler than what we found, right? I mean, we, we basically used Occam's razor, right? The, the notion that when faced with a set of alternatives, the simplest one is the most likely to be true. We used that to, against publicly available information to construct the hypotheses that we took to Senator Mark Warner and Senator Elizabeth Warren then to Adam Schiff and the House Intelligence Committee. And all the early work we did was just, you know, in effect, lucky guesses. But now the facts are coming out, right? And the facts are so much worse than I would have thought. Mm. And yet there's a pattern to them that's so extreme that it actually makes the politics of fixing this a lot easier than it was when we only had Cambridge Analytica. Because with Cambridge Analytica, the problem is everybody goes, look, my data's out there, right? But Now that when you have this thing where you explain to somebody, hang on, how many times have you bought from Amazon? I don't know, 400. Okay, great. So they have 400 examples of, at least 400 examples of your mouse movements. When you develop Parkinson's, they are going to know it before you do. How do you feel about them selling that to your insurance company? That gets people's attention in a real hurry because we can stop that, okay? We can make that illegal. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. If you're on the wrong side of that issue in 2020, you're going home. So you think that, 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 that calling attention to those the particular issues be, initiates a process of unwinding that will go all the way back perhaps to no, the, no, I, the I surveillance I, attention I, no, economy? you can never go all the way back. But if you can stop the worst of it, then you have a chance to do the classic thing of 
capitalism, which is that you convert a problem into a business opportunity. And mm -hmm. I want to return, I want the next big thing to be a return to the Steve Jobs philosophy of bicycles for the mind. I want us to get back to making technology that improves our lives. I want to make artificial intelligence into the technology penicillin of the 21st century. But, but instead can, of this incredibly dystopian thing we're dealing with right now. Right, but can you do that when you have investors who are expecting 100x or 1,000x I, returns? Hang on. I'm going to make what they're doing illegal. Right. Hang on. I'm playing politics. You're playing philosophy. I'm mm. playing politics. And politics is real simple. You get a really large group of people. You go to the politicians and you go, we're not going to take this shit anymore. You go Howard Beale on them, right? And once you go Howard Beale on them, then you're fine. The thing I would just say here is this is a, this is a really hard problem. We have to take it really seriously. But we're never going to solve the whole problem at once. We gotta pick the parts we can win. So you think the parts we can win though are, are specific regulations on technology companies and that's the you would look. You it's would look more at than it it's more than tech companies because this has got to be regulating the cellular industry. It's got to regulate the the credit card processors, the banks. It's got to regulate everybody who has data, right? And there are all sorts of components to it. Like California's got a new proposal law. It's got a bill uh, that's going to come before the legislature that's going to give every person the right to sue to recover damages if they feel like they've been harmed by an internet platform. This is massively important because right now the incentives are such that none of these companies will self-regulate because there's no consequence for failing. And w right, it'd be like when this when you can sue the cigarette company for uh, lying about the, the and tar. It, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. If they pass this thing, that is the that is unlike global data protection regulation and unlike you know whether it's the antitrust fines in Europe or the proposed FTC fine over Cambridge Analytica. This is really serious teeth because, you know, California's a big state, got a lot of people. It's where these companies live. I mean, it really is going to change everything. You wouldn't want to just break some of them up? Hang break on. up. Facebook, I want to solve the Amazon. problem. Breaking them up. I don't. Zuboff makes the point that breaking up Google and Facebook and into 50 companies means you have 50 guys doing surveillance capitalism. That's not a help. What I want to do is undermine the actual business model itself. Okay? And my point to you is. Are we going to break them up? I have no idea. Politically, that may be a portion of the outcome, but from my perspective, that's not what I want to do with antitrust law. What I want to do with antitrust law is clear space so that the next big thing, this bicycles for the mind, has a chance to prosper. I want to treat it the same way we treated MCI and Sprint uh, in, in the late 70s and early 80s when they had a protected space in long distance. You have to give them an opportunity. Right now, there's no sunlight. There's no sunlight, no nutrients to compete with Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, you know, and or Microsoft. And there has to be. I mean, if you look at this, Google's done this incredibly brilliant but in amazingly cynical thing in their venture capital arm where they dangle these bright, shining lights called, you know, cryptocurrency or blockchain over here and they go over here they've got stuff your parents used to do for you and over here they've got uh, transportation and they go hey see we think these things are important we're putting our money behind this we're going to back you and we'll buy some of these companies from you which they then quietly write off after they buy them back mm -hmm. but they buy enough to keep the venture guys going meanwhile nobody's investing in the businesses that could undermine google's business and i look at that and i go these guys are smarter than i am so all I got is the possibility that there are more of us than there are them. And so that's the way I'm going. I mean, I may be wrong, okay? But that's the way I'm going. No, it, it, I mean, it, 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 you had a tailwind for much of your life. And you seem to know how to find them. So you know what no, I mean? No, that's, so, sorry, the tailwind's yeah. pure dumb luck. I'm just in the right place at the right time. And knock wood, I'm in the right place at the right time again, right? We don't have much wood here. Oh, yeah. But, but. Seriously, it, it's, I don't know the right answer, but that's my hypothesis today. And what I've learned, somebody here knows something I don't know, probably a lot of you, and I'd like to hear it because yeah. at the end of the day, the struggle that we're in is that this is all of us. And, you know, I read this Wall Street Journal thing, uh, I guess it was over the weekend, where they were talking about how democracy is not obviously the best home for capitalism going forward. Mm. And I'm sitting there looking at this thing, thinking to these guys, 
they are normalizing authoritarianism as an outcome. And the problem is that, you know, with their multiple classes of stock and the founders having absolute control, the Silicon Valley companies are deeply authoritarian. And because of the nature of their business, they must align with power. So they're always going to be on the side of the big guy against the little guy. And that's, you know, we've got to be really careful about that. No, oh, it's bad for the humans. But um, let's, um, it, in, in the spirit of people in this room knowing stuff, that, that we should learn. Let's hear from them. Uh, are there uh, uh, thoughts, questions, concerns? I'd like to start with women, if we can, okay? I think it's, <laughs> it's no, it's really important to start with the women. <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Um, my name's Mara, you yeah. yeah, my name's Mara Einstein. Um, I actually teach with Douglas at Queens College. A um, couple of things. One, in all due respect, there have been a lot of academics who've been doing the same work that you've been doing, but because we're academics and we haven't come out of Silicon Valley, we do not get the same kind of platform. I totally agree. Do. Hang on. And can, can, can I respond to that and then yeah. get your question? This, she is just making the most profound point on earth, okay? There are domain, thousands of domain experts strewn around the world on these actual issues who have not been heard around pediatrics, around psychology, around government, around technology. And my job is to make sure that Professor Einstein and people like her get heard. Now, please go ahead. Okay. Two areas that um, I have questions or want, want to ask you about, but, but also gives you some information about. Um, one voice is going to be the next big area in terms of where everything is going. It's about 80% of, of um, requests from Google is going to happen through voice over the next couple of years. And I don't know what you're thinking is in terms of being able to put some kind of reins around that. The other area of concern for me is I'm looking into marketing higher education. And right now, they still talk about a sales funnel. And they talk about, uh, they look at, we're talking, you're talking about underage, you're talking about minors, they're looking at 15 and 16 and 17 year olds, and they are tracking them as soon as they go on to, yeah. to their websites. And what has happened is they've all figured out that they need to upgrade their websites because they need to be able to tap into these kids. And this is, this is a huge industry now, and there's a tremendous number of minors that are being tapped into and being tracked through all of this. And I think it's something that parents don't understand, and I think that's, that could be another area to tap into. So, first of all, thank you very much. So on both of those issues, I'll start with the, the voice control systems. So how many here have an Alexa or Google Home device? Okay, so let me just, um, does anyone here have it in their bedroom? Okay, does anyone have it in their office? Okay, so here's the problem. These are surveillance devices. They're there. You know, your use case is likely to be playlists, weather, and maybe hands-free uh, queries if you have multiple kids under the age of five, um, which is, as far as I can tell, the single most legitimate use case. I think the parents of multiple kids under five, I have not figured out a better thing than Alexa in that situation. Um, so here's the problem. They're listening all the time. There are three potential failure modes. Failure mode number one is they're listening all the time, and the only thing you have going for you is that, that Jeff Bezos has told you he only records when it says, hey, um, hey Alexa. The first time uh, a product manager has a problem and needs to make numbers, you can expect that to get relaxed. There is not one example in the, in the data economy of companies not pushing the boundaries every chance they get. Second problem, these products are manufactured mostly by Huawei and CTE. Now, I don't happen to agree with the Trump administration on many things, and I don't know if they're right on this or not, but right now we're citing those companies as being a national security risk on the basis that they can listen to anything going on on devices they make. Uh, and again, they don't make all this stuff, but they make a bunch of it. And, uh, and so you've got all the issues of the hardware makers and the potential security threats there. And then lastly, every one of them is on top of the Android operating system. And last I checked, you had to be done with fourth grade before you're allowed to hack Android, but I don't think you have to be any older than that. There was a family two weeks ago that received a thing on their Google Home security thing that told them there were inbound nuclear missiles coming. These are incredibly hackable. And you're making a bet on 
of all of really important information in your life. If you're in politics, for example, and you have one of these things in your home, you are insane. I mean, at some point, somebody's going to get bribed to turn the thing on full auto for a politician. If you're an engineer, you, if you are doing anything important, somebody's going to go full auto because they want to get your industrial secrets. So just be really careful with this stuff. I'm terrified. I think we have to have rules on all this stuff before it's allowed in the market, and we miss that window. We need to do the same thing on artificial intelligence. I mean, this notion that we aren't requiring AI to demonstrate safety, efficacy, and, and freedom from bias before we accept it in the marketplace is clinically insane. Essentially, every AI system out there that's been delivered to date has some form of bias built in. You've seen it in facial recognition, you've seen it in mortgages, and you've seen it in, um, in job things for resumes. Prison, uh, the, all of the stuff in the military is just, I mean, all the stuff in, in, in policing is just horrific, right? Because they're training it with the data sets of the old world. And you say to yourself, oh, well, they just forgot. And I'm going, actually, the people buying this system have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. So I would actually argue that you shouldn't assume that these were mistakes. Microsoft is now issuing a, um, you know, they have a, uh, a, a, a thing in there a risk factor in their quarterly statements about the fact that they make a lot of this stuff. So all of that scares the crap out of me. So on kids, I don't have uh, children of my own, but I've talked to a ton of pediatricians about this problem, and I refer to several in, in my book. The thing that's really obvious now, right, is we ran an experiment on a generation of children, exposed them to technology early and aggressively, thinking that was going to prepare them for life, which is really what your book what Team Human describes as this extremely, uh, you know, uh, job-oriented form of education, you know, missing the basic point of education. What we now know is that, that the brain plasticity of children is, you know, deeply affected by overexposure to these screens, that too much uh, dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, stimulation affects their ability to pay attention, and it does so in a way that's permanent. And so we have to be really careful. So they're saying now no screens up to age two, practically no screens to 13. Whatever you do, no screens in the classroom except for special needs kids. Um, what you really want to do is have kids learning how to concentrate, learning how to focus, and learning how to socialize with other kids. And again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just channeling what people like Dr. Einstein are saying, that um, you know, we ran this experiment on kids, and now we know better, so we need to stop. And you know we need to make we need to get away from the fear economy, right? We need to say to ring doorbells. I'm sorry, the people wandering through my neighborhood are not all enemies, right? We do not need to treat every stranger as an enemy. In fact, this is America. We're better than that. So you know, knock wood, we'll we'll make some progress on those issues. But I am deeply indebted to people like yourself who do this for a living, because all I am is an analyst. Okay, and the reason I'm doing this is because I have the ability to channel the work of others and get it exposed. But I don't claim any of it as my own. And when you read the book, you'll see the, uh, the bibliography that comes with it. And, the, and the, I have, I think it's like 15 pages of acknowledgments and uh, at least 10 pages of bi bibliography that's, a, you know, that's a, an essay. And the reason for that is that I don't have a single original idea in that book. Okay, What I have is a megaphone, and I'm using it. Uh, Roger, I appreciate your um, approach to uh, right and wrong, that, that it's sort of a Manichaean world that we live in. But as the professor has mentioned several times, that uh, the right keeps writing books and the wrong keeps winning. And it seems to me that the reason is that the wrong has a business model, a for-profit business model that allows them to continue to make those incremental opportunistic gains year after year. Um, have you thought about engineering a business model for the right side that can actually compete on a level on a on the existing playing field uh, with the wrong but very profitable wrong? So I think about it every day. Can you see who you are? Uh, Chris Woods and I'm actually working on a business model for that. Okay. So 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 my my what I'm trying to do is to make the changes in the economy that will allow your idea and other ideas to have a chance to succeed. The problem we have today is that it's too easy for the established monopolies and oligopolies to crush. I, I don't think you can 
innovation. Well, no, I, I know you believe that, and, and I believe that at a point in time. I'm more optimistic today, and I'll tell you why. So in 2016, there were 4 million people who did not vote at all who had voted for Obama in 2012. 4 million in an election decided by 77,800 votes spread across three states. The Trump campaign's genius insight, and this was, this was Bannon. Bannon had the insight that Facebook's advertising tools and therefore the advertising tools of Instagram allowed him to invert politics. It was no longer necessary to persuade people that your policies were the right ones to vote for that you could do the same thing that advertisers do in other areas. You could find the emotional weak spot of every person in the country and run N number of different campaigns where N was the number of voters you were appealing to. So they invested tens of millions of dollars in the tail end of the campaign on voter suppression targeting three groups, suburban white women, people of color, and idealistic young people. They were demonstrably successful. All three of those things have really deep downward spikes, particularly in the, in the territories he targeted. And this was a campaign that was done with the Cambridge Analytica data set and run by Facebook employees and Google employees doing the actual targeting on their platforms. And, or not doing the targeting, excuse me, doing the execution of the, of the ads. Um, what we don't know is whether they had the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee data, which would have shown them exactly which congressional districts to target, but their precision was such that you got the impression that it's possible that they had that. In 2018, the level of disinformation in the market was meaningfully higher than 2016. What happened? Three groups in particular stood out for the spikes in their turnout. Suburban white women, people of color, and idealistic young people. I do not think this is a coincidence. I think we be learning, okay? And I think that's a very positive thing. In the process, we bring in 40, we switch 40 suites, oh, seats from Republican to Democrat. You bring in a lot of young people everywhere, right? A lot of people under 40. A lot of people are digital natives. Remember, for 55, 60 years, Congress had no reason to question the tech industry, no reason to think about regulating. In fact, the whole government didn't have any reason to. You know, we trusted it, because tech for the longest time produced nothing but good stuff. And Except Google, IBM and the Holocaust and other stuff. Sorry, and you, DDT. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you know, but IBM and yeah. the Holocaust is before. Remember, the tech industry in digital doesn't start till 1956, okay? So I'm talking about from 56 okay. on, okay? Which is the relevant period, okay? I mean, I, I don't question history. History. Yeah, yeah, but you're in, you're you're in the world of analog, okay? And and I, am. I a, still am. Yeah. No, I hear you. But I'm just saying, from a regulatory point of view, we have to look at the the relevant period of time, which is '56 to to present. The flag doesn't go up until late October of 2017, so it's less than 18 months ago. The thing I can tell you is this is increasingly a nonpartisan issue. I've had wonderful conversations at the Federal Trade Commission, currently run by a, a Trump appointee, who is, I think, very open to these ideas and is initiating a whole bunch of things that are really going after these problems. I've had lovely conversations at the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, again, Trump appointee, who believes fervently that there are things wrong here that you know can't be allowed to keep going that we need more innovation, we need more competition, we need startups to get going. Now, do I know that something good is going to happen here? No, I do not. But do I know things are better today than they were two years ago? Absolutely. We are far more likely to get antitrust action under the Trump administration than we ever were under Obama or Bush. Far more likely, okay? And the world's changed. And I'd like to believe that we are collectively able to influence that. And so my point to you is you're doing the startup. If I were you, I recommend being optimistic about this. Just because, let's face it, it doesn't help you if, I mean, if we discourage everybody, that's not going to help. So I look at this as I choose to be optimistic. And I'm down there every month. And I'm getting some love. I mean, next week I get to go to the antitrust division and talk about my book. Not because they agree with it. 
but because they want to learn, right? That's really cool. And I'm really excited to do that. I'm really excited to hang with these people. I mean, I've done seven appearances on Fox in the last, like, three weeks, and they are really supportive of these ideas, right? Whether you agree with them or not on other issues, on this issue, I think we have common ground. And this is where I think Douglas is right, where this, at the end of the day, is finding what we agree about, right? There's, there's w way more that we agree upon than we realize. And it's just a matter of finding it. And my point here, and, and this is what I'd say to you, is that I'm in a position where I can do this full time. And if you're a researcher, if you really know what's going on here, you gotta do research, that's what you do. I mean, I'm not doing this to get attention because the kind I'm getting is not the kind I want, okay? <laughs> I mean, it was no fun having Bill Gates tear, tear me a fresh you-know-what a couple weeks ago. He's a guy I've been friendly with for a long time. I did not expect that. But you know what? That kind of stuff's going to happen. And that's okay. I mean, I, was, I benefited from this. It's my turn to take some hits. I want to get a couple more in before, uh, before we have to go. Hey, Roger. Hey, Mark. Uh, I'm Mark Stallman. I'm the president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life, uh, centered here in, uh, in New York. And uh, there's actually three fellows from the center here this evening. Uh, Doc, sitting over there, Debbie uh, Newman uh, here, and, and Peter Berkman. So uh, uh, Roger's here in part because he was a mentor at one point to uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm here in part because at one point I was a mentor to Roger McNamee. <laughs> True. So let's see if this mentoring can produce something useful. And as you would expect me to say, Roger, you've got it entirely backwards. Excellent. <laughs> no shock. <laughs> in fact, Marshall McLuhan in 1951 told us what was going on. Anybody who read anything knew that all of this was about manipulation, exploitation, and control. 1951, Mechanical Bride. Fast forward 2015 to a book that Doug actually uh, blurbed, The Democratic Surround, by Fred, um, Fred Turner. That's right, I helped him with this earlier book on, on uh, Stuart Brand. Um, Fred's of Stanford. And you cite uh, uh, B.J. Fogg about uh, persuasive technologies. We're living in a system that you describe as democracy, which is actually the problem. Every single one of those politicians you're talking to must have massive television advertising. They spend all their time raising money to manipulate, exploit, and control people. Fox manipulates, exploits, and controls people. You're hanging out with the wrong people, Roger. That may the, be. The, the democracy that you're talking about is not worth saving. <laughs> In fact, this is the maelstrom. So McLuhan had a... a so, a, what, Mark, what are we supposed to do about it, okay? Because I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm I'm I gotta gonna play... You, I'm gonna okay. tell you, okay? <laughs> McLuhan, <laughs> as a mentor, see if I can help a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> McLuhan focused a great deal on a f uh, 1841 short story called The Descent into the Maelstrom by Edgar Allan Poe. And in this remarkable story, one sailor recognized that what everybody else was doing, which is what you and all your buddies are now doing, was taking us right down the maelstrom into death. You have to find something that is not what everybody else is doing to float to the top. That's what I believe Doug is writing about in Team Human. It is democracy as we understand it and as you describe it is not the victim. We are the victim of that system. So what do you have to do, Roger? And, and the rest of these people you're talking to, you have to step outside of all of that. Now in fact, digital technology presents radical alternatives for all of us because it shifts us from the world that you know very well. Roger's a, a very accomplished musician, as you heard from the beginning, closely associated with, in the beginning, not so much now, I guess, Grateful Dead and, and so forth. 
And I, I know Roger very well. He treated all this as a game and played it very well. Now he's playing another game. That's not the right game, Roger. <laughs> Good to know. Well, the trick is what is then what is the right game? So, I mean, you know, and I had this uh, talk with a with a former Secretary of State who was who was very pleased to disillusion me by saying, "Oh, Rushkoff, now do you realize that democracy was a failed experiment?" And that was that was a scare. In other words, because of Fox and because of the internet and all this, that that we we can't be trusted to vote effectively because we're because we're you know manipulated idiots, and that going into uh, going into uh, 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 politics as the as the solution might be, he too was arguing that it might be short-sighted. But then the question is, well, then how do we enact uh, uh, what we are? You know, if it's not if it's not through civics, then what's left? Hey, how are you? Um, this is probably one of the simpler questions, but uh, given what we've been discussing, I was just curious, do you think that Mark Zuckerberg is an implicitly good person? And if he is, you know, do you think he understands it? Do you think he's like, understands the implications? Do you think he had a Robert Oppenheimer moment where he was yeah. like, look what I've done? I, I keep, I hope the answer is yes. I, you know, I didn't know him. I knew him in a business sense, so I didn't know all of him. And, uh, I keep thinking he's one good night's sleep away from the epiphany, the Robert Oppenheimer <laughs> moment. No, I'm, I'm really serious about this, that he has an idealism for certain. I think he's having a really hard time understanding what the hell's going on. Because for the longest time, I think he believed that we just didn't understand why what he was doing was so important. And I know when I went to him, he, you know, in retrospect, it's pretty obvious he didn't understand what I was you know, that the point I was making was not a PR problem. It was a business problem. And uh, I'd like to think that he that he's a really good person. i got to be honest with you that when since we've known a lot of evidence, their denial of all that evidence and they're continuing to create products that do more of the same is not encouraging. And uh, I don't know what to do about that, okay, which is why I think, you know, we have to use the tools available to us to try to affect change. Um, and again, maybe it doesn't work, but I'm going to do my best. He may be a good person, but he's a bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> right now, anyway. Uh, but thank you, Roger McNamee, for being on Team Human today. You can get Roger's new book, Zooked, on a platform monopoly of your choice or your local bookstore. You can also find links to his work and that of all our guests at teamhuman.fm. Articles based on my monologues can be found at Medium, along with annotated archives of all our shows. I'm still touring with the Team Human Manifesto, and you can support this show by getting the book or coming to teamhuman.fm and clicking on support. This is a team effort. Team Human is a production of the Laboratory for Digital Humanism at CUNY Queens. Our community manager is Luke Robert Mason. Our associate producer is Josh Chaplin. Team Human is produced and engineered by Stephen Bartolome. Thanks also to Cameron Tompkins and everyone at the Green Space for hosting this event. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and you've been on Team Human, our last best hope for peeps. Thanks. Thank you.